All right. Um, so this is the second part of the talk. I'm Paul for Oracle. I mostly hack on core libs, and I occasionally dip my toes down the rabbit hole in the VM and stuff like that, and scramble back up and ask someone else to help me out and learn. So I'm in danger of uh, segving this talk, so I'm going to overflow. But I set a trap in for the workshop later, so we can either continue if I run out of time, or we can deep dive into issues. And any slides I skip over, we can go into more detail in the workshop and continue the discussions we've had already on there. And also, there's the legal safety, too. We've got to be careful about that. <laughs> um, here's a rather astute observation. If nothing else works, a total pig-headed unwillingness to look the facts in the face will see us through. <laughs> that is from General Sir Anthony Cecil Hogney Melchard from Blackadder. And to some extent, this is true because, as Mark said, it's an internal detail. Developers haven't been ignoring this fact. And to be fair, to be fair we have too a bit. And yet, to some extent, this has seen us through, as Chris has said. Um, as Cliff has said there, yes, we have a peek and poke thing. People can do this. It's season through. We get stuff done. But, you know, we can do a lot better than this going forward into the future. We can start to strengthen the platform, make it more safe, introduce safe public APIs that do a better job than unsafe do, and then we can start optimizing under the covers a lot better than we do today. For example, unsafe forces layout, representation, and so forth like that. When you peek and poke at memory, you don't necessarily know that you're peeking and poking at a final field and stuff like this. It makes us harder to optimize the platform. So I think we can categorize the use cases of unsafe into four broad general categories. So we have sort of an enhanced uh, atomic access here. People who use compare and swap and all sorts of stuff like this. We have stuff that like interoperate across the JVM boundary. People use get put. JNI, efficient memory layout and access. People use allocate free memory, put gate. They want to hide from the GC and stuff like this. So I think there's lots of other use cases too, but these are the four sort of broad categories that people do, like serialization, mocking, proxying. I would include in that where people use allocate instance. And another one here. The two are almost identical but subtly different. And we can map these use cases to features. So. We have, say, enhanced atomic access. I'll be talking about variable handles here. We have interoperate across the JVM boundary. So this is Project Panama. Um, foreign function interface, we've already talked about this. Then there's efficient memory layout and access. So it, that covers Project Panama, Project Hal Valhalla, Arrays 2.0. So Dan talked a bit about this earlier. Brian will talk about <coughs> this as well. It all fits into this picture of how we can move away from unsafe with these types of features. And there's a nearer term focus, so we can tackle some of these use cases now, and we can tackle some of these use cases later. So the things I'm going to focus on on these things, and in terms of the efficient memory layers and access, I'm going to talk about a few small things around array bounds checks and array access, which I would like to use here and in other places as well. So there's a replacement strategy here, is that I want to hunt for the right in hotspot intrinsic the most general one I can reuse in lots of little other places. And you've seen that applied to what Vladimir talked about with uh, Lambda forms. There's a very nice divide between the JVM and the JDK layer. And I'm trying to find little sweet spots for what I want to do here. So I'm going to skip these changes except one. We'll talk about these in more detail. Some methods have already been added to Unsafe uh, by Red Hat's Andrew Haley. These are get and put unaligned methods and they're leveraging uh, byte buffers to improve the performance in byte buffers. So if you're interested, have a look at those. Essentially, they're intrinsics, but align up if you're on an unaligned architecture to the normal gets and puts. But if you're on an aligned architecture like Spark, it drops down into a little branchy code. That's actually a nice way to use these methods rather than having to handle this yourself. So I'm going to talk a bit about array bounds checks. There's a number of small things we can do around here to improve arrays. They've been a bit of languishing. We haven't given it enough attention and care, I don't think, over, over time. There's, there's one issue that's been hanging around for a while that Chris Mock fixed ages ago in a patch. There he is. We're going to try and get that in. Strength bounds checks on stuff so we can improve bounds checks in fork join and so forth like this. And then there's a, um, some work that Roland's doing. We can add arrays check index intrinsic 
which sort of tells the hotspot, yeah, what you're looking at, this index is a signed in, but what we really want to do is make it look like an unsigned thing when we're doing checks. And then we can perhaps GC the buffer check index that's in there, that's a hotspot intrinsic. And as part of that, we can improve scale calculations for array access when you're using unsafe, so we can get some nice tight code when we're doing hot loops. Some checks are really tricky to optimize, though. There was a good example on Valhalla around Almax and Disruptor's ring buffer, which essentially pads the buffer at two ends. And it's really hard to optimize those kinds of checks out. What they really want is contended arrays. How many people would like contended arrays here? Nobody. Someone would. <laughs> what we really want to say is perhaps allocate an array on a, a cache line boundary in these particular cases. Perhaps we need something like that. It's useful in fork join. It'd be useful for LMAX disruptor. But Doug, Doug pointed me to, uh, if you really want to go to town on array bounds checks, this language X10 is good to look at for inspiration. And maybe we can learn some stuff around uh, applying that for AOT. But also, if we had real final fields, perhaps we could do a better job on these types of stuff too. So array mismatch. What I'd like to do is add an intrinsic for an array mismatch method. And we can get reasonably far developing that using unsafe. And we can get further leveraging vector extensions in the future. But I will show you in a moment. <laughs> and that is essentially the building block that we can use to build up arrays, equals, and lexicographical comparison. Now, this lexigra array lexicographical comparison is a bit of a meme going through. You see it in Apache Cassandra and all these other places. And they're all doing it the same way, and they've all made the same mistake, in a sense, because it all works on x86 fine, but depending on what version of Hotspot you're using, it might have crashed on Spark and might get really slow on Spark because Spark's an aligned architecture and it doesn't support it. This is I knew you'd say that. I can't possibly say that. <laughs> but, it's, but I think uh, ARM, ARM as well, if you get into bedded. ARM64, I think, is OK. But there's other architectures will come along as well where this goes in. So the principle still applies. But yes. If we have this method in there, we can GC particular intrinsics for arrays equals for characters, string equals compared to. Perhaps we can GC those. So we're making it more general and more usable in other places. And then perhaps we can consider using it for equals compare of managed and direct byte buffers so we can improve those cases too. So here's an example of what it looks like. There's a vectorized mismatch method here. It takes an object, which is actually an array, but we don't have a super type for array yet. See John's talk next uh, tomorrow, I think. And we have an offset into it, and another array B with an offset, and a length, and the uh, log two of the, the array index scale we're talking about here. So essentially, we're doing something that's a very common pattern that people have been doing using unsafe, which is looping over this as longs. We check if uh, the two values are, e are not equal here, and we do some bit twiddling and pop out an index, positive index. And if, it, if we don't find a mismatch here, what we do is we return one plus negation of how many elements in the array to look at there. Pretty simple stuff. And we can add another unsafe method on top of there, which is Java, which uses this after a certain threshold. If not, it bombs out here. And then we can actually implement our compare unsigned in arrays like this. And then you can see we, we, if, we get a, if we get a positive value here, we, we compare bytes unsigned, otherwise we return length. And that, that works. And we can do that for byte, we can do that for char, short, and so forth like that. And we can do it for longs as well. So the question is, if I implement this to longs using this, and I compare it to equals using the simple thing, does the code, are the two performant, are the two the same? What do you think? Which one's faster, which one's slower? <laughs> well, <laughs> It, it turns out unsafe is not as fast as people think it is. This is a misconception. It's been optimized in some areas, and it's not been optimized in other areas. So the loop, you see we're doing two reads here of longs and a compare and a branch and a, a compare. So this is a little snippet of the unrolled loop here in the assembly. This is about as fast as you can get. This is pretty neat if you're just using longs. But there's a bit of sort of slop, if you like, coming in here. It's tracking, it's tracking the sort of index in the unrolled loop so that it, when, it, when it breaks out at the same location, it can return the mismatched index based from 
its current offset essentially. So it's, it's a bunch of code here, and that makes a, that makes a difference if you're really interested in performance. So the magic thing to do here is pick my other intrinsic that Roland wrote for me, and stuff it in here, a bit of magic pixie dust, and then you get almost the same code popping out. That that check index intrinsic gives enough to hotspot just to ensure that things get nice, nicely read. Uh, if you notice here that the, the branching is slightly different because we've got to recover the index, mismatch index, back from there. But since this is equals, Hotspot's not smart enough to know. All you need to know is break out the loop. And you shouldn't have to track this. And maybe there's other optimizations. But I don't know if it's possible going down a rabbit hole to see. But there's tricks we can do with this with bits of intrinsic, bits of building blocks to improve the situation. I got some performance results here. As someone said earlier, they're lies, so don't have to believe me. But I did some measurements here uh, comparing uh, longs based on sizes here. You see the greens are longs comparing uh, the speed up based over a loop. And you see the, the speed up for when you're doing longs, it's exactly the same. That's what you would expect. And for bytes, it ramps up as the fixed costs of the array mismatch mess are overcome. So the question is, can we get bytes faster in the future? What happens if we in make that an intrinsic and use AVX instructions like 256 or 5112? That method is there so we can actually intrinsify it in the future and get even faster. And we should get faster there too. Um, so C2 looks good. C21, C1. Anyone care about C1? No? Should we? <laughs> should I bother optimizing for it? <coughs> And the interpreter is slow, so I've got to do some more work here to see if this is a viable solution if I don't intrinsify uh, the method. And there's a future here around vectorization. Perhaps we, the next iteration here is perhaps we can in GC that particular thing and then move to some form of safe and safe vectorization API in the future um, and, and get better perform and more usability in all sorts of other cases too. And I think that's probably could be a key thing for arrays 2.0 and stuff like that in the future. Uh, wave hands, how that would work out, but I think that's a very interesting direction to take. Okay, so variable handles. Um, if you go to this issue here, you can go, it will give you links to go to a sandbox to get the source code and play with this and check it out if you want to play. Um, so the current situation is we've got relaxed, mostly atomic, uh, volatile atomic, get put field, bytecodes, so forth like this. And we've got the Java Util concurrent star classes, which operate on int long and object and arrays of. How many people use these classes? Good. How many people would prefer to use unsafe as opposed to those classes? <laughs> Both. Depending on your performance requirements, essentially. Yeah, yes. 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 <coughs> and we have good old unsafe to peek and poke at memory with multiple addressing modes and enhanced atomic access for int long an object. So the goals I set myself for vari uh, variable handles was a safe replacement for unsafe that could replace the, uh, the atomic access use cases used in Java Util Concurrent. Because Java Util Concurrent didn't use its own atomic classes. I would like to be able to replace the unsafe in Java Util Concurrent with implementations of variable handles and get the same performance out. So comparable to unsafe, better than atomic, and an API better than unsafe. So I've set a really low bar API-wise <laughs> and a really high bar performance-wise. You know. And I'd like to corral all these, all these, atomic, uh, all these uh, enhanced atomic operations and fenced operations into one location. So a variable handle is a single class that represents a dynamically typed reference. So it's a cross product of variable kinds, types, uh, with read-write access modes. So what's a variable kind? So a kind is, is defined by a lookup of a var handle. I'll get to this in a moment. And it could be an instance or a static field of a class. It could be array elements or views of. It could be byte buffer contents on and off heap. There are many things that are considered generally variables or variable kinds. And there's variable types. Types, again, defined by lookup. So we could have object references, primitive types, in the future, value types, perhaps as a vectorization kind of type if you're viewing over arrays, stuff like this. And there's a bunch of access modes. So the access mode is defined by a signature polymorphic method where the mode, kind, and type determine the method signature. 
And so we can have uh, fenced accesses for all types. It's a question whether they should be atomic in all cases. For example, if you're dealing with unaligned access on aligned architectures, perhaps you have to relax that assumption. And then enhanced atomic access for certain types as well. Um, Alexei Shipilev would like to try and do this for all types if possible. Unfenced compare and swap. Okay. Can you email that to Doug? <laughs> I have. <laughs> I will ask. Sorry. Who is writing code that uses fenced accesses other than Doug's request? Use SID in types of things like LMAX disruptor a little bit. Okay. Not too much. Mm. We use it in JRuby to pass on some memory model guarantees as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is not designed for normal Java, Java developers. This is designed for the, the Doug, no, no, dogs of the world and so forth like that. Uh, we don't really want to trumpet its existence as a feature that should be talked about to general Java developers for sure. Okay. Pardon? I can't hear you, sorry. Oh yeah, that's to be, to be worked out based on, <laughs> based on this. Um, it, it, it could depend on where it comes from. Uh, so we have to work out details like this. So here's an, here's an example of, of our handle class. So it has a bunch of uh, signature polymorphic methods, one for each access mode. So there's a bunch of these. So we could have what uh, Cliff said he wanted was one without fence. So there's a bunch of like, Relaxed access, there could be a fenced one for set release, one for volatile, and then the atomics like compare and sweat, get and add, and so forth like that. So it's a pretty low level class. Actually, we've already added some stuff to unsafe mark in the interim, but we're going to have to find an extra home for when we move it out of the sandbox. But uh, uh, Alexei Shipleth added put uh, and get acquire for all the primitive types. So we're trying to get parity with C atomics in a sense. And we could probably GC the put ordered star name. No, the names that we got, lazy put, put ordered star, they're really confusing names. I prefer these types of names, so that's one of the motivation. We didn't implement this with relaxed access and fences because the way it's implemented in Unsafe today, there's things related to CPU order barriers and independent in reads, independent rights handling and stuff like that. So Alexi implemented it as intrinsics video today as a conservative approach in the way it currently behaves. And there's signature polymorphic methods here. This is one of the things that gives us the ability to optimize. It avoids the boxing and packing of arguments, which is what, it, what it's used before for method handle invocation. And being in the Java Lang invoke package means final fields are really final. Who would like final fields to be final over the whole of the JDK? There are wonderful optimizations to be had when you, when you allow this. Yep. <coughs> yes, yes. It's um, set accessible and unsafe or kind of, it makes it hard to uh, optimize final fields, that's for sure. Yes, no, we know. Oops. Uh, and as this, there's this interesting flag you can try out if you really want to, which is trust final fields on non, uh, trust final non-static fields, but it has to, it only works if a containing object reference is a constant, so you can give it a try. Yes? Two small uh, notes. So I started a discussion with Hotspot, uh, Hotspot Compiler Dev List about uh, making instance final fields optimizable by the compilers. So we envision two approaches, conservative and optimistic. Uh, optimistic meaning more stringent uh, uh, runtime checks. So if you are interested, please participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to know more about when it breaks and what, why it breaks, what people, and we know some cases 
obviously with serialization is a classic case of this. Yeah, no. So I think we have a story, sorry. So I think we have a story for serialization, for custom serialization frameworks using uh, unsafe allocate instance and uh, uh, a reflection on two new, uh, new factories. So uh, it shouldn't, uh, uh, so, so it works well for plain bytecode, but uh, for, for uh, uh, expert level APIs, we have a story how to, yep. uh, to fix that. So these signature polymorphic methods, they're like low-level linkage for signature type checking uh, with minimal dependencies. Essentially, I'm leveraging the hard-coded bits of invoke dynamic to implement the machinery underneath. I adapted it to support non-polymorphic return types, so compare and set. You don't have to do any sort of uh, casting you'd have to do in method handle invoke. And it requires, alas, some small updates to the Java language and Java virtual machine specification. It's kind of like a, a thin slice through the whole stack because currently it's specified that the only signature polymorphic methods are those in method handles and I'm adding another one to that uh, set. So here's an example of lookup. So I want to look up uh, variable handles for these types of things so I can do it exactly the same way as you do it using method handles. So I can find a static field var handle, I give it its, uh, where its receiver is, its name, and the type. I can look up an instance one, or I could look up a, uh, an array element. Exactly the same as you do in method handle state. It's the same access control checks as well. And the annoying catch exception for any error, although it'd be nice to do something about that. And then there's invocation. So I've looked up these method handle, var handles, and now I can actually invoke on it. So we see, given the, the, the static one, we don't have any arguments to it because there's nothing to pass into it. The signature polymorphic method means I have to cast it to a string, so that's kind of a negative in terms of the API. I have to tell it what the signature is here. But compare and set's fine because the return type is not polymorphic. So we want to compare and set on my example <coughs> with a value. Can I also argue that concern set to return the, the value that the hardware gives you now? Yeah, there's a. It, or why you fail? I talked. I I talked to Doug about that, and he was going, well. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, he says, well, in 80% of the cases, I don't need that. So maybe. I need to get some data to, if you can give me more data uh, to help drive that conversation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, someone else asked me this uh, uh, as well from a coherence team in Oracle. They, they, they were wanting that type of compare and set as well. I don't think it's that costly to add. I mean, it's another little intrinsic inside the, uh, the hotspot to use, use something slightly different, but I don't think it's that hard. In terms of value, the hardware gives you it. Yeah. 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 So you can see get and set, so forth like this, operating on arrays as well. And we don't have to box the array into another class like in atomics and so forth like that. So what are the semantics here? So essentially invoke exact semantics like on method handles. So if I look up uh, a field var handle, I want to do a compare and set on it. <coughs> you notice here I have to cast it to null here to tell it what the type is. Because this is signature polymorphic, I encode the types at the call site. And null normally would map to void. I don't want it to map to void, it's a string, so I have to cast it. But the, it's the equivalent semantics are, I look up a fine virtual I, I look up a, a method handle using fine virtual to the var handle class, to the compare and set with the types I want, and then I bind that method handle to the var handle instance, and then I invoke exact on it. So it's the same semantics in terms of, almost equivalent semantics in terms of compilation and invocation. The question is, could I get it down to invoke semantics? 
so I don't have to do these annoying casts to null. And I don't necessarily have to cast the, the T if it isn't an instance of test and so forth. For that. But that might have a cost to it. I need to do some experiments. But it improves the API. And then would it be possible with target typing to remove the cast on the return type as well? If we could do target typing on method handles and variable handles, we could actually improve that approach too. Given this is an advanced API, I, it may not be necessary to go this far, but it, we could do more to improve it. So, pardon? Okay. So, nano performance. So, Alexi Shipilev, unfortunately, can't be here. I wish he was. Um, he's been doing performance measurements. We're not ready to, he's not ready to publish them yet, but when he is, I'm sure he, he'll publish them all with some very decent information. So far, it's on par with both C1 and C2 for runtime compilers, uh, runtime compilers for field access. And more results will be pending. I did some, uh, result, uh, did some performance evaluation in my talk last year. I don't think that's fundamentally changed. <coughs> and then more on the macro. Um, so far, it's looking OK with an updated fork join pool. Uh, Doug, Doug, thankfully, has been uh, playing around with this and looking very carefully at how this behaves in uh, fork join benchmarks. I opportuni opportunistically asked him to do this while he was doing some other analysis based on G1 and all sorts of other things. So, so far it's looking okay, but he's observing an increase in startup costs, which can put the fork join um, application into, into a situation where it gets unlucky or bad runs. And we think um, it's to do with, um, there's early garbage going on due to increased static initialization. There's early GC, and then things get shuffled around and moved around such that it increases effects of false sharing increases the probability of that. That's what we think is going on there. So, have I got time in hand? Good. Um, so there's more work to be done there, but so far it's okay, or not terrible, I think might be for dogs. <laughs> dogs. On the list of terribleness, it's at the bottom of the terrible list, so that's a good, that's a good sign of all the other stuff. That could be terrible. So under the hood, I just wanted to have a look what's going on. I picked up, um, I'm going to analyze, I've run a, a simple fork join benchmark and I want to analyze the machine code when using unsafe and when using variable handles and see what pops out. So I took fork join pool as of 1st of August. It's already changed. It's like a moving target. And run it against the 166 loops CC fit benchmark. I just picked one which was reasonably appropriate. And I wanted to look at the inlining traces and generated code for a particular method, fork join pool work queue poll. I want to compare it with unsafe variable handles and variable handles with those bound checks optimizations I talked about earlier. So here's the, here's the method. Let's see what it does. So it basically there's, a, there's the, the fork join uh, pool work array here with all the, uh, the tasks in. Check if it's not null. Uh, do some other thing here. Check if the array length of this, uh, the queue is greater than zero. If so, do some shifting here to get an offset based on some index, get the object out of the, the, the task queue at the offset. If it's not null, compare and swap it to null. So I want to I essentially pop a task off the queue like this. And this is, this is all integers. That's an integer. So we, know, we, know, we trust Doug, so we know we're not going to get an overflow here. But if you're writing code in general, that's a potential source of problems if, you, if, you, if your size of your array grows. So you have to be careful there. And then once we compare and swap it out, we do a, a store fence there. Um, so the variable handle, if I just flip between them, it's not that different. We get cleaner API here with the index. You don't have to worry about shifting and adding. We could get relaxed. And we do a compare and set. Unfortunately, we have to, ca uh, we have to cast this to null to tell it what the types are. There's not a lot of change in code. It's a pretty easy transformation. And these should be safe. So we, sh we have to do bounds checks here and here. And, but if you're in unsafe mode, you don't have to do bounds checks here. You know what you're doing, right? And also, it's doing a particular type of mode, which I talked about earlier, which is it's essentially masking the index based on the array length minus 1. 
So this is the inline trace in unsafe. So we can see a call to unsafe get object and compare and swap. And that's the inline trace for variable handles. And you're thinking, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it actually hotspot sees all through that, like, just like in method handles. It, it just sees all through it. Um, and it's actually probably larger than necessary because C1 does not support um, stable uh, array contents at the moment. So we could probably reduce this down. But if you, looked at, uh, if you recall to Vladimir's presentation, you see a similar pattern here of, 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 of doing some checks, going in and doing some casts, and then going down to unsafe. It looks very similar to the method handle setter and getter type code. And that's by design because it's using very similar techniques underneath. If we add the bounds checks in there, if I'm using unsafe here for compare and swap, I need to, I, I've changed explicit bound checks with a call to raise.check index here. And you see it showing up in the, um, in the inline trace with bounds checks. You don't see any bounds checks here because I'm just doing equivalent of an AA, AA load here. So it's, it's just using normal array access. So let's, let's look at the machine code for unsafe for the, uh, a bit of this method. So what we're coming in here, remember that um, check for the array length zero in the code? We go back here. So that's that little test there, the green in here, conditions and bounds checks. And then we, the, the orange is a bit of index calculation. So you see two decrements here and then an and. So we're getting the index into the array. And then the blue here for unsafe is essentially the load from the array. All that blue there, unsafe is not particularly efficient in this case. And the reason is, is because uh, we'd, we're, we're not um, the calculation of the shifts and the adding is all done in integers and then converted to a long. If you convert the index to a long before you do the shift and the add, you get more efficient code. So this is quirky. You know, this is a, these are tricks you learn by looking at the assembler case. Unsafe is not as optimal as you might think. Yes? So uh, I'm in C2, making it work right. Yeah. 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 And there's tweaks we can, uh, Roland's done some tweaks to improve it too. Um, Sure, there's more we can do. And then we see a test null here, um, and then we see the compare and swap. So at least it's, 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 it's saving the address here and reusing that. That's a good thing. So the, the R11 here to access the, the element at the index is the same we use for the compare and uh, the CAS. So in var handles API, it's slightly different. All we see is um, we see the same test for the array um, length zero. We see uh, well, a bit of register, a bit of shuffling going on here to calculate the index, and then we see a bounds check come in before we actually access the array index, because we have to check the, the AA load, we'll do the bounds check. And there's also a bounds check here, but it's getting dominated by this one, so we don't see it twice. That's good. In there, but we've got some, we want to get rid of this. So if we take uh, Chris, Chris's patches and Roland's patches, we get, it, we get it down even smaller. So we see the, the check here. We see the, the small check for the index. And then we see a more efficient uh, way of accessing the, uh, the reference to the fault joint task. So it's all compressed down. And I'm, I'm, I'm slightly cheating. I haven't, if I optimize the unsafe one to do the long index, it would get almost to exactly the same code as this. Pun? Um? In. have to ask Roland that one. <laughs> you, think you, you think you can get an overflow here? I, I, what I'm saying is those patterns yep. on, uh, on scanning through your map to scan the array were illegal and only would be caught by weird corner cases where you took negative indices that were right at the edge of the universe and then you skipped the scale and added them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. There is a non-trivial thing unless you can show bounds checks on the int that include uh, weird corner edge cases. We can go off on this. Okay. I'm curious if you actually did it right or if it's just wrong and it's just a missing check. Right. Because, you know, you're already in unsafe land. Yeah. Yeah. 
But we have to look in more detail on that. I, I think I want to point out here is that the, the generated code for var handles and unsafe, actually when you do the proper pattern for unsafe, should be almost similar here. Because the, the bounds check gets strength reduced up to there um, in, the, in, the, in the dominating check. So that's actually pretty good. There's a lot, you saw that inline trace, but it all goes all the way down and it spits out almost the same code. And we can actually change that to relax access if we want to. We don't have to do it using a VAR handle. We don't have to do it using unsafe. Because we've got these bound checks optimizations in place, we can just do that now, simplify the code if we want to. So there's a bunch of exotic VAR handles that I can talk about in the workshop. People have questions and stuff like this, so I'm not going to go into it here. I think I've got about two minutes left. Um, as array views, we can um, use pseudo-aligned, unaligned long views over byte arrays. That's pretty common. People do that a lot using unsafe, as I did with the array mismatch. But perhaps we can, we can provide a var handle to expose that type of pattern for viewing uh, bytes as longs. Or perhaps, um, uh, longs as bytes, if you want to go greater than the integer.max value. <laughs> Could it be the way around? Uh, we can access manage and direct byte buffers, so we CAS on byte buffers too. We don't have to add these methods to byte buffer. We can CAS directly, and in fact, with a very small tweak to buffer, I can use the same addressing modes for direct and on heap and off heap that people use today, um, depending on wh whether the, the byte array is null and whether, what the address is and so forth. We can actually unify it. We can also do a little hack to if, if, a, if, a, if a class has fields of the same type, multiple instances, multiple instances of fields of the same type, we can view that as an array as well, and we can iterate over that as an array just for fun. So if we had a complex number or a point 3D or something like that, we could view that as an array. And this, this is interesting. Can we get vectored access to arrays and views of, as I talked about earlier, and maybe uses some kind of concept of vector that has a window over the array as we sweep over it and provide vector operations on there. And it, and it was all nicely intrinsified underneath the covers and we provide the Java API provides enough to hotspot for the patterns to do the vectorization. So that's it. Uh, we can spill over to the, to the workshop. As any, any quick questions now? Yes. Uh, regarding uh, the join pool uh, pop uh, example you have. Uh, do you have a story for unsafe uh, fans methods? So because here you have, uh, yes. you still use unsafe. Yes, you're quite right. We're going, we, we're going to put um, a smaller version of the fences, what we propose to do is put a smaller version of the fences API that Doug proposed a while back. We're going we're gonna to stick that in Java U to concurrent, I think, and then do the unsafe dance from there. To there. So there'll be, there'll be explicit fences as well as a fenced access methods through var handles. Okay. Yep. Has anybody in this room tried to do a B tree, an efficient B tree implementation in Java? Uh, and you ran into the problem you couldn't do inline arrays. Uh, and so that one of his exotic array handlers gives you a workaround for that. Oh, very good. You need to go reference, reference it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we can, I, I have some more slides that can go into in the workshop to talk about unsafe methods, who's using them, sh what should we do with them, and so forth. I'd like to get data from people, and we can deep dive more into this if you, you wish. I can show examples and stuff.